On behalf of the National Institute of Statistical Sciences, I would like to welcome our viewers from around the world. My name is Daniel Jeske, and I'm coming to you from the Department of Statistics at the University of California in Riverside, and I'm delighted to be the moderator for what promises to be a very interesting webinar entitled, What's in a Name? Data Analytics, Machine Learning, and Artificial Intelligence, and What Else? In the fall of 2015, the American Statistical Association released a statement on the role of statistics in data science. Included in that statement is a remark that the ASA is well positioned to help formulate discussion around the role of statistics in data science and to navigate the way forward in this quickly evolving environment by providing forums for communication and collaboration among data scientists, including statisticians and non-statisticians alike. Today's webinar is a call to action uh, for that communication and facilitating discussion. The discussion and communication will, will be led by our headline guests, Victor Lowe from Fidelity Investments, Al Stern from the University of California in Irvine, Lee Wilkinson from H2O, and Vincent Granville from Data Science Central. Here's our schedule for today. And you can see that uh, there'll be a time for questions uh, from our viewers uh, at the end of the prepared remarks by our speakers. I just want to briefly review the logistics uh, of our webinar this morning. Uh, our studio hosts back at NIS are Glenn Johnson and James Rosenberger. And the attendees uh, viewing the webinar will be view only participants, but they can use a question and answer feature at the bottom of the Zoom window to type in questions that we can then uh, have for the Q&A session. To do that, just click on the Q&A icon that you see at the bottom of your Zoom window and type in your question for the panelists. Also, uh, when the speaker is sharing his or her screen, you can minimize the displays of the other speakers so that you have more space for the slides uh, by clicking on the dash button that appears um, at the bottom of the, uh, or, sorry, at the top of the panel that shows all the speakers. So at this point in time, I would like to uh, begin our webinar by introducing our first speaker, Victor Lowe. Uh, Victor leads the Center of Excellence for Artificial Intelligence and Data Science in Workplace Investments at Fidelity Investments. Previously, he managed advanced analytics teams in personal investing, corporate treasury, managerial finance, and healthcare and total well being at Fidelity Investments. Prior to Fidelity, he was the vice president and manager of modeling and analysis at Fleet Boston Financial, which is now Bank of America. Victor has 25 years of extensive consulting and corporate experience employing data driven solutions in a wide variety of business areas, including marketing and finance. Victor. Thank you. Okay, thank you for having me. My name is Victor Lowe. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Dan. Um, so I'm gonna, he I'm gonna be talking about evolution of different terms, and many of these terms may be interesting and familiar to many of you, including data science, AI, and statistics, of course. So, Okay, uh, so first we will talk about data science and then AI and machine learning, followed by analytics, and last but not least, operations research or optimization. And we'll talk about how these fields or terms are related to statistics and how they work together uh, with an illustrative example. So first let's uh, take a look at some Google Trends data on search popularity. So I put in some terms here uh, at the top, five terms, and uh, this is the uh, popularity uh, over, over the past five years. As you can see, machine learning and um, machine learning and data science are tracking pretty closely over time, and they're at the top. And statistical analysis and business analytics are also quite close, uh, but they are not as popular, at least in terms of search, uh, over the past five years. So uh, this just basically uh, says that uh, there are more people searching 
for those terms like data science, AI, and so on. Um, and what it means is in the, uh, in the corporate world, in many industries, uh, many people who are doing heavy statistics, their titles are not necessarily statisticians. Their titles may be data scientists or something else. So data scientist has become a very popular uh, job title lately. So let's see what data scientist actually means. Well, data scientists data scientist actually appeared in the news a lot uh, in the past 10 years at least. So 10 years ago, uh, a well-known economist, Harold Varian, said the, the next sexy job will be statisticians. In 2012, an article published in Harvard Business Review said that data scientists will be the next sexiest job of the 21st century. The article was published by Tom Davenport and DJ Patel. Tom Davenport, as some of you may know, uh, has published a lot of books and, um, and articles on business analytics, among other things. So he has highly publicized uh, the usage of analytics in the business world. And the latest book he has uh, uh, is AI, but previously, I think he used the term analytics mostly. Uh, the second author, DJ Patel, became our nation's first chief data scientist under President Obama. So that might tell you something. So is data scientists really that popular? Well, let's look at those uh, two things at the bottom. Both LinkedIn and Glassdoor over the past uh, five years, four years, and basically said data scientist is one of the top jobs uh, according to both of them. Now, LinkedIn previously used the term statistical analysis. Uh, uh, the, the latest one is AI, a similar kind of function. So that probably tells you something. So what is data scientist? There are many definitions of data scientist. Here are some of them, and some of these may be, may be funny and laughable. But the most common one is the second one. It says a data scientist is someone who is better at statistics than any software engineer, and also better at software engineering than any statistician. That's by and large correct because uh, data scientists usually need to uh, use a lot of software engineering and a lot of statistical skills. It's really a combination of those two skills. And I'm not sure about statistics on a Mac. <laughs> So how is data science related to statistics? Actually, there's a lot of link there. Back in 1997, a prominent statistician, Jeff Wu, proposed that statistics to be changed to data science, and statisticians should be called data scientists. Well, a few years later, another prominent statistician, Bill Cleveland, in 2001, proposed more or less the same thing. Uh, he suggests expanding some major areas of statistics, such as computing or statistics, st statistical computing. And let's change the field to data science. However, both of them did not gain a lot of attention from the statistics community. So, so the name actually has not changed. So data science, the term data science actually came out uh, if, uh, much after what Bill Cleveland and Jeff Wu said. So it came out more recently in the industry instead of the academic world. So what's the uh, definition of data science? If you Google about data science, you likely will see a Venn diagram like this, maybe three circles, maybe four circles. So the first one is computer science or computer programming, uh, which includes uh, a lot of heavy coding, uh, ETL, and also unstructured data gathering or data processing. Unstructured data gathering is really uh, one, one piece that is different from at least traditional statistics because data scientists often have to mine uh, unstructured data, including text, voice, and images. So that's, that's one, one distinction there. Uh, the second circle is stat and math, and obviously statistics is a key component of data science. And then the third one is subject matter expertise. Uh, whatever you do, however you apply 
you need to know something about the, the subject matter. So if you apply st statistics or data science to marketing, you need to know something about supply and demand curves and, and customer segmentation. If you work uh, in the risk analytics field, uh, you may want to know something about market risk, credit risk, or operational risk, or all of them. So that's the subject matter expertise. In addition to the technical uh, knowledge, data scientists often have a lot of soft, soft skills because they need to interact with the uh, business people uh, who don't necessarily have the, the analytic skills that data scientists have. Uh, and they actually have to interact all the time. And they also have to interact with uh, IT people to help them uh, with the data and, and model deployment. So a lot of, a lot of, a lot of the skills include uh, business consulting, writing and communication, which is uh, almost just as important as the others. And let's talk about AI and machine learning. So what AI means, loosely speaking, is really just mimicking human behavior. Back in uh, 1950, Alan Turing already solved the uh, Enigma puzzle during the Second World War. And he was the, uh, was the hero who did that. And in 1950, the war was over. So he was thinking about something else. He was thinking about, hey, wouldn't it be great if we can come up with a machine that can think by itself? Uh, that would be awesome. But he passed away in 1954. In 56, a team of mathematicians and computer scientists uh, grouped together at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire. And they thought about, hey, we're going to create a machine that Aaron Turing proposed. And let's call it AI. So that was the birth of AI in 1956. Uh, it, during, the, during the next couple of decades, so in the 70s and 80s and so on, the, the, the first generation of AI came out, uh, which is known as rule-based or, or expert system. So what it does is really to tell a machine exactly what to do. So let's say if you want to come up with a medical diagnosis system, you would group together a team of um, medical experts. And you would ask them what kinds, of, what kinds of symptoms may lead to what kinds of uh, diagnosis. And then you hard code those rules into, into the machine. So that's the uh, rule-based uh, expert system. That was quite popular in the 70s and, and 80s. Uh, starting the 90s, the second wave of AI, uh, which was known as machine learning, became more and more popular. So it's very different from rule-based. Instead of hard coding some uh, rules, you let the machine learn by itself. As long as you feed the machine with a lot of data and you also set a goal, what are you trying to achieve? Obviously, this is highly uh, familiar to many of you uh, if you are a statistician. It's re really similar to uh, uh, regression analysis, logistic regression, random forest, and so on. And in fact, uh, linear regression and logistic regression are usually in the f one of the first few chapters in most, in most machine learning books. So it's, it's highly related to statistics. So that's AI and machine learning. And you also may have heard of the term called deep learning. So deep learning is actually uh, a form of neural network, uh, which is a complex uh, machine learning method. So it's a subset of machine learning. And machine learning itself is a subset of AI. The other part of AI is, mo is mostly the expert system or rule-based system. Okay, the next topic is uh, analytics, which includes data analytics and business analytics. When it's applied to the business world, it's called business analytics. And analytics is, is an interesting concept because it has three uh, cate categories, descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive. Uh, if you use weather forecast as an analogy, uh, the weather or the temperature yesterday was basically a form of descriptive analytics, just what happened. Weather forecast itself is a form of predictive analytics. And if you know something about uh, 
what the weather will look like. You know, then you can you can decide how many layers you want to put on, whether you should bring an umbrella or whether you should work from home or study from home because it's going to snow. So that is basically prescriptive. If you automate the uh, the the actions a little bit, then it becomes prescriptive analytics. So prescriptive analytics is about uh, optimizing decisions based on what you know about the future, so or what you know about something you don't know for sure, and that's pre that's predictive. So there's a there's a huge link between predictive and prescriptive. Prescriptive is often followed by predictive. So prescriptive analytics actually belongs to another field. Statistics contributes a lot to descriptive analytics and predictive analytics. Prescriptive analytics usually belongs to a field, another applied mathematics field known as OR or operations research. OR was born uh, during the Second World War for making better military decisions. And it was about optimization. How do you optimize decisions? If you know something about uh, the future or something about the unknowns. So after the war, it has been deployed to the business world uh, in a, a wide variety of business applications. And in business school, business schools, OR is called management science. Uh, more recently, uh, they sometimes call it business analytics, or at least it's a subset of business analytics. In engineering schools, uh, they are sometimes is sometimes called industrial engineering, i.e. So whether it's OR, i.e. and MS, uh, they're all trying to solve uh, some kind of problems by making better decisions using, using math and computer science. So OR is also linked to machine learning. So how is it linked? If you build uh, supervised learning models or predictive models or machine learning models, however we call it, and usually you need to optimize a set of weights and statisticians and economists may call them parameters. So we, we need to optimize them uh, in models and similar to minimizing least squares or maximizing likelihood in statistics. And that itself is an, is an optimization procedure. It can be done uh, using an OR model. So that's sort of OR helping statistics or machine learning. But you can flip it. Statistics and, and, and machine learning can also help OR because if you can predict something about the future or something, some unknown numbers, and you can use OR models to optimize your actions. So that's the, the reverse uh, of that. And, and, and that is the link between predictive and prescriptive analytics that uh, was on the previous slide. And more recently, there's a, there's a more known technique called reinforcement learning. And it is, a, it is a very neat technique that actually combines predictive and prescriptive modeling. So it combines it in a way uh, that we can maximize long-term reward through self-training. Uh, it's, it's, be, it, it's become pretty well known because uh, it's been widely used in uh, things like video games, um, chess games like Go, as well as self-driving cars. And it's really a combination of predictive and prescriptive analytics. So I talked about uh, all these techniques. So how are they going to be working together? I'm going to illustrate uh, one, ex one practical example uh, in, in, in business, which is called CRM or Customer Relationship Management. What it is, is really to track and optimize customer contacts. How it does is really to learn something about historical customer contact data and then apply the knowledge or, the, or some kind of models to improve future customer interactions. And it usually starts with uh, some kind of marketing campaign design. And the design could be done by uh, you know, tra traditional experimental design. And in the, in the modern age, sometimes it's, called, it's known as A-B testing. So you have a treatment, you have a control, or you have a treatment one, treatment two, versus control group, and so on. So you want to test different things. And then you execute uh, the marketing campaign. And then you measure the results of it using 
some kind of statistical analysis, including significance testing and so on. Uh, and then after that, you want to know something deeper. You want to know what kinds of people are most likely to respond to what types of treatment. Then to do that, you usually need to build some kind of machine learning model or statistical model. And that summarizes the knowledge of, you know, what kinds of people are likely to respond to what, type, what types of treatments. So after you have a model like that, you will need to optimize uh, your actions for the next marketing campaign. Uh, because there are, there are usually many treatments and many individuals there, and it becomes a, a difficult optimization problem. So that's where all, uh, operations research model comes in. If this looks like, if th this looks familiar to you, uh, it should be. It's actually uh, very similar to Six Sigma and also somewhat similar to clinical trials. And this, this is my last slide. So this is just to illustrate why uh, uh, the optimization problem is, is complex. Uh, in marketing or CRM, let's say you have multiple channels. You can call customers. You can uh, um, you can do something on the web. You can email them and so on. And then there are all kinds of messages or, or offers you can offer them. So that becomes a, a lot of links here. And then because there are so many customers or potential customers, and it becomes a uh, a very complex problem. How do you combine the right channel and the right message or right offer and then assign them to the right people, uh, everyone? And it usually is done through a, a pretty complex integer programming model. And uh, some of you may have heard that integer programming model is NP complete, means it's, it's really complex, it's really hard to solve. So there are lots of heuristics and approximation methods to solve it. All those require statistical modeling or machine learning models uh, as an input because those models can link between uh, the individuals and the offers and channels, telling you the likelihood that each person would be accepting an offer uh, by treatment. So, so this, this is how uh, operations research and statistics and machine learning and so on can be combined together uh, just to solve one problem. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that talk, Victor. Um, I'm sure it's going to prompt a lot of thoughts and uh, we might see some questions for you at the end where we'll have time for uh, questions for all speakers. It's my pleasure now to introduce our second speaker today. Hal Stern is the Chancellor's Professor of Statistics at the University of California in Irvine and is the Vice Provost for Academic Planning at UCI. He served as the founding chair of the Department of Statistics and was also the dean of the UCI School of Information and Computer Sciences. Hal is known for his research in Bayesian statistics and for collaborative projects in the life sciences and social sciences and is the co-author of a book on data, uh, Bayesian data analysis. And he's a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the ASA and IMS as well. Hal? Thanks, Dan, um, and thanks, Victor. Victor's remarks uh, set me up well uh, to talk about uh, the role of statistics. Um, so let me share my screen. And uh, I would start by mentioning uh, one thing about our, uh, my setup here at UC Irvine, uh, somewhat unique. The Department of Statistics is in the same school with the Department of Computer Science. And as Dan just mentioned, I had the opportunity to serve as dean of that school for six plus years. And so work quite closely with colleagues in computer science. So uh, that relationship informs what you're about to hear, which are just one person's opinions. Uh, so I gave my talk the subtitle, Arose by Any Other Name, because uh, I think that's a lot of what's been going on. That's a lot of what's going on here. Um, when we talk about data analysis, uh, a friend of mine shared this paper, which uh, again is relevant to today's conversation about what matters for data analysis, which are the theories of statistics, the, our local expertise, um, computers, uh, increasing amounts of data, uh, and it, data in more and more disciplines, humanities, social sciences, and the like. 
But the interesting thing, of course, is this paper was published in 1966. Um, so the conversation we're having today is, as uh, Victor mentioned and others have mentioned, uh, really a continuation of an ongoing dialogue about the role of computing and statistics. Uh, Victor covered a lot of what I'm about to say, so I'm going to go quickly. Uh, there are all these terms, and there's a lot of confusion. I hear it at my university. I assume everyone listening hears it in your company, university, agency, whatever. Uh, for me, one of the apocryphal stories was I had someone approach me about their data and say, and I said, oh, yeah, sure, I can help with that. And they said, no, no, we already tried a statistical approach. We want to try a machine learning approach now. Um, and those kinds of comments are fairly common. As Victor said, uh, given the confusion about all these terms, the people have tried to come up with diagrams. So here's a small subset of uh, diagrams. Uh, one, I, I don't have the one that Victor showed, but several others of uh, varying degrees of complexity. Uh, I have to show the next one just because I absolutely love it. Uh, this is a, a little bit of a humorous take on, on it. By adding a fourth circle for evil, you get some very interesting combinations. Uh, so I, I, won't, I won't belabor this, but there's some good stuff there. So a couple of my points or my takes on the terminology discussion. Uh, part of this story is reasonably clear, which is artificial intelligence is a very broad term in the computer science world, and machine learning is a piece of it. And deep learning, uh, the use of these deep neural networks are a part of machine learning, they're a specific uh, application. So Victor talked about AI, it goes back a long time, and as the name implies, rep, re, re, is used to describe all attempts to get machines to do things that we all long considered required human intelligence. And so basic programming is an example of that, but obviously some of the neural networks and expert systems are more sophisticated versions of that. The term machine learning has been around for a long time, but as Victor's first slide with the data showed, it's really emerged recently as a real force. And uh, Wikipedia noted, um, not their word, not their words, my word, uh, machine learning in some sense emerged in the computer science world when people said true AI was too hard. Um, and therefore, let's just find algorithms that solve problems, which is a wonderful thing to do. I won't say a lot about deep learning, but I just think it's super interesting and compelling. Um, deep learning has been minimized by some people by saying, oh, that's just data fitting. And it's true, but it's extremely powerful data fitting. You know, the fact that you can talk to your phone and have it understand you is, is testament to that. And the progress in computer vision is also testament to that. Um, this is a, a, li a little bit dated, but it shows that in a period of five years, using this deep neural network technology, uh, research groups were able to take the human vision problem, that is take images like the couple that you see here, um, from upwards of a thousand categories and classifications, and train them to do super well on test sets. Um, so that in 2011, the best approaches were getting 25% error rates. And over a period of five years, um, and it dropped below 5%, which is at some level human performance because the images are, can be complicated and complex and blurry and all these other things. So really quite amazing technology um, it, it has been developed uh, largely out of the computer science world. The place where it gets more interesting to me, to NIS, is the relationship of AI and ML, these techniques, to statistics. And it, to me, there it's a lot less clear. And that's where I guess I want to focus my remarks. So on this slide, I have some of the traditional definitions of these concepts, including a dictionary definition of statistics, which is as a mathematical discipline focused on collection analysis and interpretation of numerical data. Um, artificial intelligence, as I said before, primarily about getting machines to do tasks requiring human intelligence. Machine learning, a little bit trickier to define. I think, as Victor said, there's this notion of machines learning, but I think we all know, you know, machines don't learn except in very prescribed circumstances. That is, we can give them a task and a framework, an algorithm, a class of algorithms. Uh, they can do super well at that. And so that's how I think about machine learning. To start synthesizing the two, I want to start with some of the stereotypes. So I don't necessarily believe these. 
I don't necessarily not believe them either, um, but uh, these are things you hear if you talk to computer scientists on the one hand or statisticians on the other. So statisticians, when they talk about machine learning, will often say things like, machine learning is a computer scientist having discovered statistics, um, and that they don't really spend enough time thinking about where data comes from. On the flip side, computer scientists will sometimes say things like, oh, statisticians, they're just focused on the mathematics. They don't really care about solving problems. Statisticians are not well-versed in their algorithms, so they can't handle very large data sets. Like in many stereotypes, there are seeds of truth in uh, both of these stereotypical descriptions. But of course, they don't do justice. These are very large communities of statisticians and machine learning people. As uh, NIST is an institute of statistical science, I think we all know within statistics, the very history of statistics is about collaborating with folks who have data. That came first with people like Fisher. Uh, the mathematical theories in some respects came second. Um, and though there are some people who focus on the mathematical side, many statisticians, especially in industry and government are very tied into data um, and academic increasingly so as well. But let me review briefly what I think of as some of the key skills and ex expertise that computer scientists and statisticians bring to the table uh, and then argue about you know, how we might work together and what modern data analysis looks like. So historically, I think we think of computer science as really being focused on things like programming languages and databases and algorithms and innovations in those spaces, uh, you know, include things like parallel programming and uh, distributed databases, uh, a wide range of algorithms, uh, including the deep neural networks that I just talked about. Because computer scientists have these skills, that is, they're fairly standard part of the computer science skill set, as computer scientists became more engaged with data, the skills allowed them to more easily obtain data. Uh, you know, web crawling, for example, is a fairly trivial task for computer scientists. And until recently, most statisticians were not really able to do that kind of thing. Um, Victor mentioned the heterogeneity of data that machine learning people are using in terms of text, imaging, voice. Um, again, doing that was assisted by their facility with programming and algorithms. And in particular, one of the things that I've noticed in my career in statistics, which is more than 30 years at this point, is you're quite likely to hear a statistician give a presentation in which they kind of say, I, you know, here's what we did. And at some point we got limited by the size of the data set that we could do using our method or our algorithm. And computer scientists rarely, if ever, will say that. Um, they always have another approach. But of course, statistics also has unique skills and contributions. Uh, to my mind, they include you know, the careful thought about experimental design and statistical sampling about data collection. As we know, the fact that you can grab data off a website uh, doesn't make it useful for a particular scientific question. And so thinking hard about data collection is a skill that we bring to the table. Uh, the mathematical theory that we're sometimes belittled for is also critical to understanding how algorithms work and how they can be improved. Uh, most important for me, the last two bullets on this slide, I think statisticians, when they are seated at, seated at the table in a conversation about a data analysis, are always emphasize the role of uncertainty, uh, for example, via confidence intervals. Um, but there's a distinction between optimization, as Victor mentioned, and you know, data analysis, in my mind, in a data analysis often tries to get a little bit beyond the optimization to say, how sure are we of the answer? And lastly, of course, the distinction between correlation and causation. Uh, when you don't think carefully about data collection, um, and you run algorithms, you can find all kinds of interesting correlations that may not be addressing the scientific question of interest. So in terms of how I, th uh, my title is kind of the role of statistics in modern data analysis. And so to do that, to introduce that, I guess I wanna talk about what I think of modern data analysis. And I'm not sure how many of the people on the call uh, remember this old advertising campaign for Reese's peanut butter, but it was, you know, you got peanut butter by chocolate, you got chocolate by peanut butter. And I, it's, it reminds me of the discussions right now is people in statistics department sometimes get a little upset that computer scientists seem to be impinging on 
statistics uh, and vice versa. And um, so the marriage, the Reese's peanut butter cup in this case, uh, in some sense is data science. And um, I will confess, I kind of like that idea. Um, I will acknowledge others don't. Um, I've heard many statisticians say, you know, of course we're data science. You know, computer science has nothing to do with that. We've always been data science. And uh, I don't think that's quite right. So I showed a bunch of Venn diagrams before. Uh, the one that I like and that here at UCI we've been living with a lot is this one. That is, when we really do marry statistics and computing and some domain, um, we think of that as data science. Uh, we created an undergraduate major in data science about five, six years ago. Um, it was really natural and easy for us to do so because we had statisticians and computer science in the same school. And we had a pretty shared vision. The computer scientists here make a lot of use of probability modeling. Uh, so that's informed a lot of my thoughts on this. So what do I think about data, uh, modern data analysis in a data science world? Uh, the way that I think about this is to the extent possible, I think it would be great if we could try to avoid getting bogged down into the terminology and in trying to figure out what's machine learning and what statistics. I tell an anecdote, which is a graduate student here gave a presentation and said, uh, for their thesis, they were going to be working on comparing statistical and machine learning approaches to a particular problem. And I, I said, you know, can you tell me what you think the difference is? And they put up a slide and it said things like regression trees under machine learning. And I said, you know, you do know regression trees were invented by statisticians 40 years ago. So um, I don't quite get your split. And I gave him the advance warning that he should think hard about whether he wants me to be on his advancement committee because I'm going to ask him that question again. Uh, so, I, I, so I'd like us to avoid that. Uh, the way that I think about this, and it's not unique, is that there's a wide set of models available, a wide set of modeling strategies available, and they differ on a wide variety of characteristics. How much human input is required to build the model? Regression models require a fair amount, deep neural networks less. What's the size of the model number of parameters? Deep neural networks can have millions of parameters. Traditional regression models, many fewer. How much data is required to fit the model? How strong are the assumptions? Our traditional linear regression makes some very strong assumptions. And that's why non-parametric models you know, became so much more popular in recent times. And how interpretable are the results? So I think those are important dimensions. And then I'm not the first person to say this. Uh, this came out of an article in JAMA the Journal of the American Medical Association, in which they took a number of traditional kind of problems and analyses and contributions and categorized them on two dimensions, how much data on the horizontal axis and how much human effort was built into the modeling and how much machine effort. And so at the top are things like uh, general generative adversarial networks and uh, techniques that have been used to have machines play Go and to teach themselves to play Go. Um, on the bottom, you have kind of your traditional doctor visit where it's informed by a hundred doctors, a hundred patients, and that uh, hundreds of patients and that doctor's experience. And in between, you get things like some of the things we've attempted so far, regression models for risk scores, or uh, more sophisticated rule-based uh, disease classification models and, and the like. So, uh, so I think this view is, for me, I find this view helpful uh, in terms of thinking about the trade-offs in particular problems. So it's important to note also that applications that we do vary also in what they want to achieve. So is the particular objective prediction, if you're building a driverless car, um, you really have a big prediction problem and one that's important to all of us. You wanna make sure that you can identify when there's a person in front of the vehicle. You don't necessarily care to interpret how you're doing that as long as there's very strong evidence that you can perform that task with very high degree of accuracy. Right. In other settings, in medical, uh, in defining new treatment strategies in a pharmaceutical company, you kind of want to know exactly what's going on and why the drug works. Right. Uh, the applications vary in the amount of data, in particular training data. One of the areas I work in these days is forensic statistics. The forensics problem is at its root a machine learning, classic predictive machine learning problem. You would love to have millions of instances of a fingerprint known source and a fingerprint from a crime scene 
and some from examples where they match and some where they don't and teach machines to do that. The problem is we don't have enormous amounts of data like that. Uh, data types we talked about, and we also need to think about things like fairness and equity. Right? People are beginning to use applications that make recommendations for sentencing. What we do there will be different than in other settings. So what do I tell people when they come to me to talk about this? Um, I usually tell them that I think the role of the data scientist, broadly defined, statisticians, data scientists, computer scientists, whoever you're going to for help with your data, that the, right, the most important conversation is at the beginning to say, what are we trying to do? And what are the right sets of technologies to, to do it? And to me, that's informed in a, by a couple of different questions. The first is, as I mentioned a moment ago, what are your objectives? I've categorized them here in four broad categories. Obviously, other people disagree and have different categories here. You can think about purely predictive problems, as I mentioned, uh, where deep neural networks are powerful. You can think about interpretation and prediction, where traditional linear models and random forests come into play. Uh, you can think about inference and what I often call effects of causes, that is it's traditional questions of program effect effectiveness and treatment effectiveness, assessing programs and effects, assessing treatments in medical studies. Um, and last, of course, increasingly in disciplines that are generating large amounts of data, there's a lot of data description and exploration. I think Lee will talk a fair bit about that. Uh, genetic studies and the like, how do we visualize these massive amounts of data and generate hypotheses and figure out what goes together? So the question is critical, obviously. And then the other thing is to go back and review some of the constraints that I mentioned in the particular area of application. How much data do we have and what does that tell us about the methods that are in our set of feasible methods? What kind of data are we working with? Um, people do a ton of imaging data. I work with several groups at UC Irvine that do brain imaging. There's an enormous amount of data there. And in those settings, one of the things that comes up a great deal is what are relevant features? particular areas in the brain, connectivity of the brain, uh, similar things for voice as well, for text. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, in my forensic world, there's a lot of discussion now about fairness of algorithms as they begin to be deployed. Um, so all of these things also need to be discussed. And so what I often conclude by telling the people that con I'm consulting with is there's a wide range of methods, and it's a collaborative question. It's one that we should work on together, and we should talk about what methods we're choosing and why. So that last little bit, that need for transparency is critical. I've heard so many talks in which people will stand in front of the room and say, and so I used machine learning to do this task. I get no information out of that. I tell some of my science colleagues, it's somewhat analogous to saying, well, we were worried about this disease, so we use science and we came up with this treatment. Well, you know, I'd like to know a little more than that. So to conclude, I guess my take on this question, which I think is an important one, is statistics obviously has a large role to play in modern data analysis and that we will have the most effective participation in the modern data analysis enterprise if we collaborate and work together. And in statisticians, I believe, need to embrace a lot of the new methods and models, understand their strengths and their weaknesses, um, and help teach our statistics students how to use them. So I thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Hal, for that nice talk. And um, I see lots of questions are rolling in from our viewers. So I'm, I'm looking forward to getting to those uh, a little bit later in the Q&A uh, section of our webinar. I'd now like to move to our third speaker, and it's my pleasure to introduce Lee Wilkinson, who is the chief scientist at H2O and an adjunct professor of computer science at the University of Illinois in Chicago. He founded Systat in 1984 and, and actually wrote the Systat statistical package. Lee is a fellow of ASA, an elected member of ISI, and a fellow of AAAS. And Lee owns several patents on visualization and distributed 
analytic computing and is the author of The Grammar of Graphics, the foundation for several commercial and open source visualization systems. Lee? Thanks, Dan. Uh, I'm going to share my talk and here we go. I, uh, all right. Um, some years ago, I was giving a talk at a machine learning workshop, and at the end of that talk, um, a computer scientist in the audience raised his hand and said, well, why do we need visualization at all? Because the computer, using machine learning algorithms, can figure out everything there is to know in your data. So I'm going to try to show you today why, how profoundly wrong that statement is, and uh, uh, Go from there. So, I am having trouble <laughs> going to the next slide. Uh, all right. Maybe I'm going to stay in this mode. Uh, Dan, is that clear now? Uh, I can, we can certainly see your slides. Okay. Um, I'm going to keep this view because uh, using the full screen is suddenly locked. But anyway, all right. Uh, let me go back to the next slide and just indicate this talk is about visualization needed for AI. And I'm going to cover a couple of a few topics, outliers, distributional anomalies, logical anomalies, and other diagnostics that, that pop up be by using visualization. And I'm going to focus on big data because computer scientists love that and statisticians uh, are interested in it. Uh, but um, it's, it's become the focus of most new AI techniques, our large data sets. By that, I mean big N, big P. That's N being the number of data points or rows in the data set and P being the number of columns or dimensions in the problem. Now, visualizing big data is a uh, big problem. Uh, there's complexity because many visualization functions are polynomial or exponential, so you can't just whip through them in one pass. There's the curse of dimensionality when P is big. Um, I'm using D there uh, equivalently to mean as the number of dimensions uh, increases for a given data set or embedding, distances tend toward a constant. So that makes it very difficult to compute distances and then exploit them in an algorithm. There's also just a choke point, meaning we can't just send a big data set over the wire, uh, even with super fast uh, uh, um, internet connections. And then there, finally, there's real estate. You can't plot a big data set on the cloud, particularly with a scatter plot, because you're going to get a big black spot. So there are some ways of dealing with this. Let's take a look at some of them. First of all, this is an algorithm that I devised uh, over several years. It's published last year um, in a computer journal. Uh, it, it's very similar to something called core sets, where you try to cover um, points with, in this case, disks or in higher dimensions, balls. Uh, and that is, as you see here, this uh, disk covers that point. And what we do elsewhere is take disks the same size or balls the same size and try to cover individual points and any other point that's within the radius of that ball is going to be included. Um, and this is a toy data set from the internet I, I, uh, that was used to illustrate clustering. I just wanted to point out here how well this algorithm does in capturing the essential variation in the data set, including, unlike sampling, including outliers. So let's take um, a look at this high dimensional aggregation. Um, it's got a number of steps, and I don't want to go into the technical details, but basically we can even handle categorical variables by mapping them to continuous values through a procedure that's actually similar to correspondence analysis in statistics. If P, the number of dimensions, is large, we may want to use random projections or some other projection method 
to reduce dimensionality. Then we rescale the columns. We choose the radius of those balls to make about a thousand points in the end. And we call the data points on which balls are centered exemplars, and we call the data po uh, points falling inside those balls members. So what about outliers? How do we use this to find outliers in ginormous data sets? Uh, first we aggregate, then we go ahead and compute nearest neighbor Euclidean distances between the exemplars, and we fit an exponential distribution to the largest distances and reject points in the upper tail of that distribution. And that's um, described in the accompanying article. And there's also an R um, uh, package to do that called HD outliers that we developed. All right, what about anomalies? Well, an anomaly is an observation inconsistent with a set of beliefs. I'm putting a Bayesian cast on that because I think that's the best way of understanding anomalies. An outlier anomaly is an observation inconsistent with a set of points. So it's a more limited definition, such that all outliers are anomalies, but not all anomalies are outliers. You can have distribution anomalies, or logical anomalies, or model anomalies, and I'm gonna look at some of those now. Um, now, outlier detection has more than a 200-year history. Its early goal was to reduce bias in models. So if we wanted to estimate the brightness of stars, and astronomers played a big role uh, two centuries ago in this, these problems, we want to make sure that we don't let one measurement that's an outlier skew what's, uh, what the estimate is. Well, uh, many of you know statisticians no longer delete outliers. We use robust methods and other ways of downweighting them. Um, now, from the point of view of algorithms, and there are many algorithms for detecting outliers, there are really two rules we could deal with. One's the distance from the center rule, where the center is the mean, or in the case of the box plot over there, a median. Or there's a gaps rule, where a point is an outlier, or in this case, kind of an inlier, if it's far away from all its near nearest neighbors. And this generalizes, this definition generalizes very nicely to the multivariate case, uh, either the distance from the center, in this case that centroid of this uh, bivariate normal distribution, or a gaps rule. I want to just point out that what you may read about on the web, uh, especially from visualization people, is, oh, let's just do a projection. Like, let's take the first two principal components and look for outliers. Well, uh, sorry to say, but that doesn't work. Uh, and these are two visual examples to just indicate that something can be an outlier in high dimensional space and not an outlier in low dimensional space. Uh, Similarly, a very favorite visualization method among computer scientists uh, called parallel coordinates is touted as a way of exploring data and finding outliers, and it positive, it does not work, uh, despite many people believing in it. These two red profiles are single rows of a data set where the age is very long, uh, large, the weight is very low for this particular person. Education level is somewhere in the middle and hours worked is very large. Look at this lower profile with the low score on weight. Statistically, it's an outlier using some very good outlier, statistical outlier detection techniques. And yet, if I didn't color that red, you'd never see it in the parallel coordinate plot. I also want to, dampen or maybe just throw a little water on the very popular um, machine learning algorithms for finding outliers like local outlier factor and so on because without a probability model you are you're you have a lot of false discoveries on the left i just took this right from a website where he said look uh these red points are all outliers and the fact if you approach the problem statistically, the sample size isn't big enough for there to be any outliers uh, that you can uh, trust. All right, um, 
We do know, those of us who work with regression methods, that there are, there, they can be very susceptible to outliers. And we also know that there are robust methods uh, for dealing with that. What is not known by most computer scientists, at least in my experience, is that tree-based methods are susceptible to outliers. The computer scientists who claim tree methods are robust are thinking only of univariate predictor outliers, not combinations of predictors that actually invoke, that induce um, multivariate outliers. Um, and this is true for gradient boosting machines, it's true for random forests, it's true for a lot of popular tree ensemble methods. So let's quickly now move on to distribution anomalies. Um, most classical statistical prediction methods assume normal distributions, but we know quite well that there are other ones like logistic, Poisson, and so on, that are based on different error models. Now, um, skewed distributions can sometimes be transformed to look more closely normal. And if we use these transformations appropriately, we can actually help ourselves quite a bit without in some cases resorting to uh, more elegant parametric models. This is a famous data set, for example, on brain weight and body weight of a bunch of animals, including humans. Uh, and look what happens when we log the brain weight and body weight. We get a very nice scatter plot there. And in fact, uh, I, many of us know that if you tried to do a linear regression on these raw data, you get an R squared of 0.873, um, and that's pretty nice, but the residual plot of this is, is pretty bad. Um, whereas if we log the data, look what happens to R squared, it pops up to 0.921, and if I showed you the residual plot, it looked quite nice. Here's an example, though, of what happens when the dependent variable in a classic decision tree um, is affected uh, by a transformation. So I took the raw data and computed a decision tree on it uh, using a program like CART. And on the right, I did the same model after outliers, uh, I'm sorry, after a, a log transformation. Look how much better the prediction is. PRE is proportional reduction in error, by the way. Um, all right, this slide, I don't want to go through it in detail, but just to point out to you that it was John Tukey who was one of the first to recognize a class of these transformations, which he called the ladder of powers. Later, many of you have heard of the Box-Cox formula, which gets a lot more attention, but actually Box-Cox based their paper on Tukey's work and Tukey wasn't entirely happy about that because when they did so, they required certain assumptions about normality, which uh, wasn't something Tukey was fond of. All right, let me move on uh, to logical anomalies. I'm going to give you just one example. It's my favorite that I, over the years when I was asked to analyze data, uh, discovered. This is from a questionnaire that was done for a counseling psychologist in a national survey. And two of the variables in the survey were the years of an individual in a current relationship. And then on the x-axis was the age of the individual. And I think you can see that every point above that diagonal line is impossible. You can't be more years in a relationship than you are old. And I discovered it by noticing that that's a really weird distribution. Let me look at it more closely. And uh, I used something called a scatterplot matrix to do the original um, analysis. And that's where this thing popped out uh, very clearly. Well, I'm not going to, by the way, it popped out like Berkson, who was the statistician who is largely uh, innovative in, was in, in the area of logistic regression, and he coined the term intraocular traumatic test. It, it hits you right between the eyes when you look at a scatter plot like that. Now, model anomalies, I'm going to finish up by, by showing that some classical diagnostic methods and statistics translate right over into machine learning, and most computer scientists aren't aware of this.
These are residual plots on the same data set for three different models. Um, a linear model, which clearly is inappropriate in this case, a nonlinear model, which is just a little bit better, and then a tree model, which is better still. Look at the tree model. You're actually looking at the residuals um, for uh, the, uh, versus the predicted values in this tree model. And there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. Nobody ever does it, but, and it's not in the computer programs. So let's look at a real, well, that was a real data set, but I'm gonna look at a big data, real data set called the Rossman Stores Kaggle data set. It's from the UC Irvine. Uh, you can get it there or get it at Kaggle. Um, and uh, here's a residual plot that is residuals versus estimated values for the stores data set in which we are predicting sales at those stores. And I have colored a small subset of those stores that were closed and therefore had zero sales. Um, and it was only discovered through this residual analysis. Zero is way over here to the left, but look at this generalized linear model is doing terribly. Um, it's actually modeling them to be uh, quite a bit better than zero. Not only that, look at the scatter of points. They're not evenly distributed around the horizontal line. Um, now we use deep learning. This is uh, TensorFlow from Google. It's got, it's a little better. The orange points are over there by zero, but it's still not that great. Uh, it's still assigning them, in fact, negative and positive predicted values back there on the left. Well, here's residual plot for a gradient boosting uh, tree, and it's better still. Uh, again, I think those of you who know some statistics would recognize that this residual plot is heteroscedastic, uh, meaning it's got larger variance on the large estimated values than it does on the small ones. Incidentally, uh, the general kind of programs I've seen that report results for these kinds of models give you one standard error for the prediction, for the estimate, and that's not very useful because you're gonna be in trouble if you make predictions for very large models, uh, very large values um, in, uh, in this kind of a model. Well, here is a uh, distributed random forest, which does better, I think, based on the residual analysis, than any of the other methods that I just showed you. And from my point of view, uh, and my apology to Kaglers for this, but in my point of view, you sometimes want to pick a model that is better behaved even if it doesn't fit as well. And by behaved, I mean these residual plots look good. So my conclusion is always look at residual plots after fitting a model. We all know this in statistics if you fit a regression model, but it's still equally true for almost any machine learning prediction model you're doing. And I think many of you know that what you wanna look for, you're not necessarily interested in normality of the residuals uh, or the conditional residuals because many machine learning models don't care, particularly decision trees. But um, do look for a band of residuals symmetrically distributed around a horizontal line at zero. That means or implies there's no trend across the fitted values. And you also want to see a uniform spread. In other words, you don't want to see generally heteroscedasticity. If you do see that residual spread of values, then you ought to incorporate, if you're going to put this into a uh, uh, decision uh, model for corporate or scientific use, you better be aware that the errors in your predictions are not equal across all values. And if they don't meet these conditions, then listen to John Tukey. Remodel, run a new model, change the model, and uh, try it again and look at the residuals again. So thank you very much. I'll conclude there. Thank you very much, Lee. Uh, the emphasis to look at our data is a, a lesson that's always worth remembering for all of us.
And I'm sure um, there's going to be some discussion about some of the, the tips you've given us here to do that with uh, big data. I'd like to move to our final speaker uh, in the webinar. Vincent Granville is a data science pioneer with proven success in bringing value to companies ranging from startups to Fortune 100, uh, Fortune 500 companies. Uh, he developed and deployed a set of statistical machine learning techniques such as hidden decision trees, automated tagging, indexing and clustering of large document repositories, jackknife regression, model-free confidence intervals, and combinatorial feature selection algorithms. And he created the first Internet of Things platform to automate growth and content generation for digital publishers. Vincent? Uh, yep. Um, I'm trying to share my presentation here. Um, let me, so can you, can you uh, see the PowerPoint? Uh, yes, we can. Oh, I think, uh, okay, I, I think it's good now. Uh, so uh, um, I'm going to discuss the applications of uh, data analytics. Some of the speakers before have already mentioned a lot of things. So uh, the first slide uh, essentially uh, discusses, um, you know, a kind of analysis that have been done for decades and even uh, more than that. So I, I won't go through the uh, details. I'm going to uh, go to the uh, second slide. So uh, discussing about more recent type of applications like uh, NLP, which is uh, natural language processing, sentiment analysis, taxonomy building. Um, an example of uh, one interesting analysis that, that I've done um, was for the digital uh, yellow pages is analyzing the uh, search queries from a million of users for part, uh, very specific kind of keywords, specific category that was restaurant. And uh, th this kind of NLP analysis allows you to, to design much better categories that are more useful for, for the users. For instance, uh, I found in the restaurant category that the people was uh, looking not just for you know, Chinese versus American versus French restaurant, they were also looking for the restaurant location, uh, downtown, river restaurant, uh, in the mountain. They were also looking for the atmosphere, you know, upscale restaurant, uh, wine bar, pub, romantic restaurant, and they were also looking for tons of things that you don't eat, like restaurant jobs, restaurant furnitures, recipes, uh, chef, and uh, stuff like that. Uh, all the modern uh, applications include uh, automated vision, uh, Google cars, uh, chatbots, automated translation, recommendation engines, detection of fake news. There's still a lot of progress that needs to be done with uh, you know, uh, fake news, but like, you know, uh, spam detection, uh, I guess 20 years ago, it's pretty much a solved problem now. Nobody gets email about Viagra products in the mailbox and stuff like that. Gmail has been doing a great job at, you know, fixing uh, stuff related to, to spam. Uh, some uh, modern trends too, uh, IoT, Internet of Things, uh, essentially uh, dealing with uh, sensor data machine-to-machine -to -machine communication, smart farming, uh, smart cities. Machine-to-machine uh, -machine, uh, communications, just give uh, one example. Um, so, uh, when I was working for eBay, they were purchasing millions, many millions of uh, keywords on Google for advertising. And so the way that the system is working was you have a, a number of APIs you need to score the keywords, attach real to them, and all that stuff is done entirely automatically. It's machine communicating to, to machine. So you access the Google uh, API uh, to you know, get the yields, you analyze your historical uh, return on the keywords, and then you place the keywords automatically. So there's lots of statistics uh, not that difficult, but there's lots of statistics more like machine learning behind it, and it's done uh, entirely automatically. So that's what's called machine-to-machine -machine, uh, communications. Um, much of what I'm going to talk in the next uh, few slides is actually about um, applications of you know, theoretical data science, uh, new fundamental, fund, foundational uh, theorems in statistics, and um, 
lots of things that I discovered by uh, essentially working on number theory problems, which eventually uh, was able to, to discover something of um, highly valuable, mostly uh, in the uh, financial, uh, the fintech uh, industry. So besides uh, new applications, there are also uh, new models that have been uh, designed. I'm just going to go very quickly with, uh, for a few of them. Uh, ensemble, ensembles, uh, models, essentially that consist in blending two, three or four different uh, models like uh, logistic regression and decision tree. Uh, and the idea, let's say you want to score transactions, you want to attach a score to a, a credit card transaction to detect if it's fraudulent or not. Um, if you uh, score, if you have multiple scoring engines, like one based on the hidden de uh, decision tree, uh, one based on logistic regression and one based on some other uh, model, uh, you might be able to get something uh, better because each uh, specific model is good uh, at detecting some uh, patterns like linear reg regressions for finding linear trends. Decision uh, trees are good at uh, things that are not uh, linear at all. So if you blend uh, those uh, techniques, you, you can get something that's better than using uh, very sophisticated but just one simple one single algorithm. So deep neural networks, uh, deep learning essentially. So these are neural networks. They've been uh, going on for, I think Victor mentioned it, like at least 50 years or something like that. But they're coming back and now uh, thanks to high performance computing, to so the power of uh, modern computers, you can have much more sophisticated uh, neural networks with uh, several uh, layers. That's essentially what uh, deep learning is about. Uh, along the same lines, uh, usually you don't use the term deep learning when you think about these te techniques, but I would mention hierarchical Bayesian models and something I've been working on, uh, which I, I call nested uh, mixture models, which actually is some kind of hierarchical Bayesian models with a, a very generic kind of uh, you know, prior or posterior or, you know, uh, distributions that uh, go into the uh, model. Optimization techniques have also uh, evolved um, some of the speakers mentioned, mentioned a few of them. I'll just mention uh, swarm, swarm optimization, which consists in uh, you know, a, a space, a 2D or 3D, or whatever uh, number of dimensions, and you start with a hundred or a thousand initial values and you, uh, and you use you know, standard uh, optimization algorithm for each of these uh, values. And you're more likely to, to find a global uh, optimum or local optimum that's uh, in, uh, good for you. Um, Brucian motions, so that's going to be my topic uh, for the next uh, slide and uh, I'll show you how uh, some of my research in number theory uh, ended up with some interesting models that could be used in uh, uh, fintech. So here's the first uh, kind of you know model or, or time series what's uh, interesting about it is that it looks very much like a Brownian motion but it's it's not really a Brownian motion a Brownian motion you would see uh, the the variance over time grow and grow and goes uh, infinite here it's bounded actually so it could uh, be useful in a situation where you have maybe a stock market with some stock the, the prices can go up or down but they are constrained by some, some mechanism that prevent them to you know, explode or collapse. So how this uh, Brownian motion was uh, created, actually by just looking at the digits of a number like a uh, square root of two, uh, everybody knows for it's never been proved that 50% of the binary digits of a square, uh, square root of two are equal to, to one. So if you, uh, here this one, uh, it's computed on one million uh, uh, digits. Um, if you look at the proportion of digits equal to one minus 0 0.5, and you multiply that number by uh, square root of n, where n is the number of digits, that's what you get. That's how the, this chart was uh, created. Now there's a, a few interesting things also that uh, come with this. Uh, first, nobody knows what that distribution, the distribution is, but it's, it's very, it, it seems very evident if you do some statistical test that these digits uh, uh, behave exactly if they were uh, 
binomial uh, random variables of uh, parameter p equal to 0.5 and uh, independently distributed. Now, uh, to get to uh, this chart, you can do some uh, uh, use some statistical theorem. So actually, this is a, a consequence of the Berry Essen uh, theorem, which is uh, a result much deeper than the central limit uh, theorem. The central limit theorem would be a first order approximation. Berry Essen is a second order approximation, and that is even better because it's based on the fact that you're dealing with uh, what's supposed to be binomial distributions and with a parameter that's uh, close to 0.5. So that's pretty much the best you could get uh, for you know the distribution of the digits of uh, square root of two. Uh, but it's going to be very hard to, to prove, uh, obviously. But it's useful in uh, fintech. It's more something to do with uh, uh, data. It's a conjecture about a data set. A lot of people say that uh, data science is anything but science, that there's no uh, science. So I wanted here to, to show something uh, interesting that's uh, similar to a six degree of separation problem. So there is, you know, any of us, there is at most six conditions between any of us and say anybody in North Korea, for instance. Uh, so you, you probably have heard of the, the six degree of separation problem. So anyway, here I created two random data sets using the random function in Excel. These are data A and data B, they are totally uncorrelated. And I created a, uh, a chain of intermediary uh, data sets. Uh, so it's called degree one, degree two, degree three, degree four. So there's only four intermediate data, uh, data sets here. And you've seen the degree uh, one data set only one number, the red number uh, is being chained, changed compared with data A. Then in degree two, there's two, uh, two red numbers. Then in degree three, there's four and, and then it goes up and up. So the interesting thing is that the correlation between degree one and, the, and data A is uh, above 0.8. The, the correlation between degree two and degree one is above 0.8. All the correlations between one data set and the, and the next one in the chain is above 0.8. So that makes for kind of an interesting conjecture and some people with time could dig much deeper into, into this. The, the, the interesting thing is that you can pretty much say that anything is correlated to anything and that in, uh, so there's been a lot of, you know, uh, articles written in news outlets um, making uh, like various correlation between uh, something that actually is not correlated at all. Um, so the next slide actually shows the correlation table. Uh, so I mentioned these correlations already. I'm getting back to the uh, uh, Brownian motion and my research in a uh, number uh, theory. So I mentioned uh, the square root of um, uh, the square root of two as being a number that creates some interesting uh, statistical distribution. But what happens if the, the, the proportion of binary digits equal to one is different from 0 0.5? Then you get with lots of uh, interesting uh, distribution. Actually, this is uh, the percentile uh, distribution. If it was, uh, if the proportion of digits equal to one were one, you would have, would, you would have a straight line, the diagonal in that chart. But here you have something that uh, is very bumpy. If you look at the density, I, I didn't picture the density in this slide. It seems to be kind of almost discontinuous everywhere. And so it creates um, an interesting family of uh, statistical distributions with known mean, known variances, um, and uh, very peculiar uh, uh, properties that again, uh, would be of interest in contexts like stock market modeling and stuff like that. Now, this is another uh, interesting, interesting uh, theoretical uh, resource where I try to uh, generalize the, the, the central uh, limit theorem uh, to compute uh, the width of asymptotic width of uh, confidence uh, intervals for very generic confidence intervals. There's no model whatsoever about the, the data. It's entirely data driven. It's based on uh, these confidence intervals are based on uh, resampling techniques. And even for uh, there's no distribution whatsoever associated with it, 
you have a general result here that the, the width of the confidence interval is the number of observations n tends to infinity behaves like this, a divided by n at power b, and for the vast majority of data sets, b is equal to 0 0.5. That's just simply the central limit theorem. So the data sets for which b is different from 0 0.5 are obviously some patterns, they are different, they, it's, it's kind of a minor, minority of data set, but they're probably the, the most also, uh, interesting uh, data sets. Now, um, also using the same kind of uh, uh, time series uh, I've been using. So, to, to, um, so what I've been doing with all these numbers, numbers, uh, sequence of uh, real numbers and, and uh, so forth, is to treat them, even for their deterministic sequence, to treat them as stochastic processes, realization of uh, stochastic uh, processes and then compute all sorts of uh, transformations about uh, uh, these uh, time series. So um, here, uh, so these time series are derived from, from these you know, sequence of numbers. The one at the top is uh, fairly smooth, so it's smoother than a Brownian motion. The one at the bottom is extremely smooth. Uh, then you have, if you look at the uh, chart in the middle, if it was really a pure uh, Brownian motion, the, the line with the yellow dots would be a straight line. So here I didn't uh, picture um, uh, a Brownian motion. Um, so what I've been doing here is trying to uh, design a matrix that capture the chaotic nature of the time series. So it's a little bit like the first uh, exponent for those who are you know, familiar with uh, uh, time series, uh, the Earth, Earth uh, exponent, it's, uh, it's also a number B between zero and one, exactly like the one I mentioned uh, in a previous slide, and actually they are related, but Earth, uh, when that number is 0 0.5, it corresponds to perfect uh, Brownian motion, when that number is close to uh, zero, uh, it's very highly chaotic uh, time series, and when you have a number that's close to one, uh, you have uh, something that, uh, that's very smooth. Um, what's interesting is that you can develop with these uh, techniques models that incorporate very long, very strong, very long range autocorrelations. Because you, usually everybody assumes that when you're dealing with time series, the, the, the autocorrelations decaying, decaying extremely fast, but here you can, um, you can create models that you know, uh, mimic uh, strong long range autocorrelations. Uh, part of my presentation was about to discuss a few uh, visualization tools that have improved uh, a lot recently, but uh, you know, the previous speakers also have been in much more detail. I'm just going to mention one uh, particular uh, tool here, which is the um, elbow rule to detect the number of clusters in, in, a, in a data set. So typically, this is done manually. Someone looks at the black curve and decides, so there's kind of an elbow that's pretty strong at, uh, for the number three, meaning three clusters. There's kind of an elbow that's less strong at, uh, for, for two clusters and one that's even less strong uh, for uh, 10 clusters. So the, the interesting thing here is that if you look at the red bar, it's easy to compute that exactly on your data, so you get a, it's kind of a signal that gives you the strength of the elbow. When you look when it's maximum, it's here uh, maximum for, for free cluster. Then the, the other part of that is that you can uh, integrate something like that uh, in a black box uh, machine learning system. So, and uh, automatically uh, without visual inspection, without any human interaction, determine the number of clusters. Uh, I wrote a paper about that, and there's a reference at the end of uh, my presentation, and you can contact me if you want more details on these things, but I thought that would be uh, something in interesting to uh, mention. I don't have the time to go through uh, this one, the different kind of visualizations. Uh, now, uh, I'd like to, to focus on some original applications. Like I say, I mentioned a lot of 
application. Don't have the time to go into the details. Victor has done a, a great job in actually mentioning something that are very similar to kind of things I've, I've been doing, like attribution modeling. I use the, the term uh, CRM uh, instead. But here it's uh, uh, an original uh, application in uh, gaming industry which um, involves a lot of different parts, number theory, chaos theory, uh, theory high performance computing. So one, one more thing about these uh, numbers and this uh, number theory uh, research is that um, it, it's so quantum computers, quantum algorithms, high performance computing and that sort of things that are becoming very popular right now. The, the, the origin, the first problems that they've been uh, trained on were precisely uh, in prime numbers, number theory, and that sort of things. So anyway, to come back to my uh, application, it's a, a number guessing uh, game. It, there's a public algorithm to compute the, the next winning numbers. So that's, that's a nice feature. Everybody can uh, run that algorithm and find the next winning numbers and bet on those numbers. But that algorithm, um, is extremely challenging, would require thousands of years of uh, computing power, so it's totally uh, useless. Uh, another, another interesting part, so, so sorry, so there's this public algorithm and then there's a, obviously I use a private uh, algorithm. Like let's say for instance, I'm using the 31 trillion digits of uh, number P. So some people, there's a, a woman at Google actually, in, in, uh, very recently in the last few months, uh, so succeeded in computing 31 trillion uh, digits of P, it's the, it's the world record. But anyway, let's say I have those digits uh, computed in one way or, or another with a, a private algorithm and I uh, publish a, a public algorithm. So the thing is that uh, technically it's not really a, a game of chains, but for all purposes, uh, it would be considered a, a game of uh, chains anyway. Uh, the public algorithm uh, involves a uh, billion of operations and numbered at each of them if a hundred of thousands and million of digits so, so i'm saying that it's it's not uh, practical um, it's also very difficult to reverse engineer the, the this algorithm um, and uh, uh, what else you can also design your own uh, ri table if you use a participating it in that game i'm going to show it in the next slide so the, the idea is to create a game that's kind of a stock market, but that would be totally neutral. So participants pay a transaction fees, but the return is zero. So here you've got the, the, the user can generate its own uh, return table, as long as it's neutral. Here's an example based on the geometric uh, di the distribution. You see that the if you bet $1, the maximum that you can get is $1.8. Eight dollars, and in the worst case, it's going to be around 0.5. So you're losing 50 percent in the worst case. Um, and then there's about 40 percent uh, of the numbers that are going to be uh, giving you a positive return. If the number that you bet on is close enough, so it's based on the distance between the number you bet on and uh, the winning number, uh, you can have much, much more aggressive. Uh, RI table where you lose the money pretty much all the time, but on the very, very rare occasions that you win, you, you multiply, uh, you know, your one dollar by a million, something like that. That's not something that would uh, implement because it's too dangerous for, uh, for the house, for, you know, for the, the guy who's managing, uh, who's managing the operation. I'll be presenting actually this uh, gaming application at the INFORMS uh, conference in Seattle in, in October, Operation Vision, Operation uh, Research Society conference. Oh, I don't think I have that much time left. So I was oh, going to go- Maybe one minute, Vincent. Yeah, so these are, uh, you know, a lot of applications that uh, um, Amazon is using. You can read my uh, PowerPoint presentation. I won't go through the, through the details. It's it's not something really that original, but I wanted to, since the subject of my presentation is about applications of data analytics, that's why I did these four or five slides uh, uh, at the end that you can you know, uh, check by yourself uh, when you download the presentation. So um, that's it. Great, thank you, Vincent. Um, we appreciate those 
perspectives on data science um, and uh, the term theoretical data science, I, I think, could get some questions during our Q&A period, what that means relative to some of the other terms. Uh, I would like to move now to our, our question and answer period. And uh, I think what I'd like to do uh, is start that off with questions directed at some of our specific speakers. Uh, Vincent, if you could uh, stop your share for us. Um, Oh, sorry. Here we go. Okay, great. So um, I'd like to begin with uh, a question I fielded from our viewers uh, for Victor. Um, Victor, in, in your opinion, uh, which skills are more important to success in today's job market, uh, statistical analysis or coding? That's, that's a very good question. Uh, if you remember the Venn diagram I have there, I think all four of them are pretty much um, very important. So uh, whether it's computer science, statistics, uh, subject matter expertise, and soft skills, I don't, I don't think we can be lacking one of them, but most people are not an expert in all four of them. So if you know, they would know something about all four of them, but they would not be super, super great at all four of them. So it's, it needs to be some kind of a ba balance. So I would say uh, both of them are equally important, at least in terms of programming and statistics. I, I remember at a NIST luncheon, either last year or the year before, someone characterized a data scientist as a unicorn. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there is no such person that could do all of these things. Um, so that leads me actually to my next question for Hal. Uh, do you think that uh, degree and data science might be too shallow with respect to all the skills that are required to, you know, trace out all the corners of the Venn diagrams, um, and that maybe uh, data science should be postgraduate training after a solid foundation, perhaps in just one of the circles in the Venn diagrams? Uh, it's a great question, Dan. In fact, I think if you push back history a little bit, statistics undergraduate majors themselves were unpopular for many years. And a similar argument was made that to really appreciate the value of statistics, you needed the application domain, so some expertise, some, some basis. Um, and so it was thought to be a better graduate degree. Um, I have some sympathy for that view. Um, I worry a little bit about uh, teaching people, you know, like training carpenters by teaching them what every tool does, and then they don't quite have the bigger picture. Um, our data science major is half the computer science curriculum in terms of coding and databases and algorithms, and half a traditional statistics curriculum, but everyone gets a kind of core statistical theory sequence. Uh, this is our undergraduate degree and a, a core methodology sequence. Um, and so I, I think it's fair. I, when I talk to students, it's challenging to who want to know what should I do? Should I major in computer science? Should I major in statistics? Should I major in data science? Um, I think there are there's shading there and it relates very much to the first question that Victor answered. You know, I think a modern statistics education has to include some coding. It's not enough to come out and know how to run SAS. You kind of have to be able to go a little broader than that. Or, um, and the same, I, you know, people coming just out of computer science program who haven't taken any statistics classes are not going to appreciate the subtleties of data collection and causality. So um, I don't have a good answer to your question um, because I think, I, I think you know, we're happy with our data science degree. We think the students have a good set of skills to go in and contribute to teams. And that's basically what we've been trying to teach them. You mentioned causality in, in your response. And I, I was wondering about the uh, popularity, it seems, uh, or at least higher visibility of causality causal statistics, causal data analysis in recent years. And is that becoming a more important area of statistics now as we move into the big data uh, uh, environments that data science probably is involved with? I think for a variety of reasons, it's increasingly popular, both in statistics and computer science. There's a very large number of computer scientists focusing on the same types of questions and the same kinds of algorithms. Because uh, the fundamental question with observational data is whether you can 
create kind of comparable groups that look like they would have if you'd been able to do a randomized study. And some of those approaches are algorithmic or some are model-based. I think the drivers are the large amount of data. And I think the special case and the example that's getting a great deal of attention is in the healthcare world. Uh, there's a giant question about what the, how can we leverage the large amount of data that's gathered in electronic health records to inform the research enterprise, inform best clinical practices and the like. And those questions really are, it can no longer be purely predictive. You're gonna to wanna to understand why things are happening. And so the causal questions kind of rise up there. So okay. definitely okay. one of the popular areas in the near and short term future for sure. I can add something to the causality question if I may. Uh, the link between predictive analytics and prescriptive analytics actually typically requires a lot of causality because uh, if you know something about the future and you want to optimally add on something and you're going to need to know if you add on something what the expected outcome would be. So that is actually in many cases a causality question. Mm -hmm. Just uh, not many people may realize that. So the link between predictive and prescriptive actually typically requires causality. Mm -hmm. uh, before I move to Lee for some questions regarding his talk, maybe I could just uh, ask um, Victor and or Hal about a follow-up question we had about what is a good way for someone in, in their mid-career or perhaps even later career uh, to retool and expand their skills uh, to become more um, aligned with what the needs are for data scientists? Uh, obviously, it depends on where the person's coming from, but since we're in this uh, webinar, let's assume they're a kind of mid-career statistician and wondering how to retool for a data science future. Um, I think it's really important to get uh, some exposure for such a person to the computing skills. And uh, we live in a great time in the sense of a large amount of information available on the, on the internet in uh, various uh, MOOC type classes you can get or even real time online classes. Most universities, including ours, have some kind of continuing education division that, that, that create courses with a lot of online content. Uh, specific skills, you know, I think people need to really learn um, how, to, how to code more, more generally. So R skills, if you don't have them, Python skills, um, if you don't have them, are, are really good to have. Uh, to the extent that one can get up to speed on some of the things I think Lee mentioned in his talk, you know, TensorFlow and the tools that allow you to fit some of the more predictive models uh, easily. There are toolkits to do all of these things um, in the various software packages are, are, good, are good ways to go. I got, I got that question a lot from uh, friends and colleagues. <laughs> uh, so it depends on what skills they currently have, of course. If they are you know, statisticians by nature, uh, they could consider taking some Coursera or ethics courses on the internet or just get on YouTube. There are lots of things you can learn. Um, in, you know, in, the, in the data science field, uh, something that are getting some things that are getting more popular are NLP, uh, i.e. natural language processing, uh, deep learning, of course, in addition to uh, programming like Python. I took a workshop by Jim Varner that was sponsored by NIS, and I know he's given it in several places and probably has plans to give it in several more places. And he threw in um, experience with database uh, systems and softwares into the mix besides just the programming languages. Okay, uh, Lee, um, there was a few questions regarding your talks and uh, one was when you were talking about transformations, uh, it came up about uh, why not try to fit the actual observations themselves with models that allow that such as generalized linear models where the interpretation perhaps of the models isn't obscured by the transformations that can at times be a little esoteric. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I hope I, I didn't mean to suggest otherwise. Uh, in fact, before TLMs and even Tukey, I mean, uh, uh, specific models like logistic or Poisson regression, um, people did these transformations as an approximation, but 
But absolutely, if, if, if you have waiting times, uh, don't, don't go ahead and log them or something. You know, use Poisson regression. Uh, and even more specifically, if you have zero uh, inflated uh, situation where you've got a lot of zeros in the data, again, don't, don't try to use a crude method like a transformation. Use the specific model that includes that. Mm -hmm. And then there was sort of a related question for you about uh, are there ways to uh, uh, detect outliers with non-parametric tests that you like? Uh, that's an interesting question. It has some implications. Maybe the most widely used or recommended, maybe used too, outlier detection method is box plots. And they are not non-parametric. Even though a box plot is based on the median and quartiles or hinges, um, in fact, Toki devised the uh, inner and outer fences based on the normal distribution. So in fact, if you have a very skewed data set, positive or negative, those outliers are uh, not gonna be outliers, first of all. And second of all, Tukey's calculation doesn't depend on N. So if you run a million, uh, a box plot on a million points, you're going to get tons of outliers. Uh, and uh, so anyway, that's, that's not a non-parametric, um, excuse me, outlier method. There are some interesting ones. There are isolation forests in which you uh, identify an outlier by looking at the distance it takes down the tree, the number of nodes you have to traverse to um, classify an outlier, to code it uh, for that value. And those are very interesting. They work quite well. They are truly non-parametric. Uh, and there are a bunch of other methods that uh, computer scientists have developed. I'd also highly recommend taking a look at uh, some of Ru Peter Ruscio's methods. Uh, he's he's uh, got some very interesting approaches to outlier detection. Um, and then David Donahoe has methods. So anyway, I'll leave it at that. There, there are a number like that. Could I add something to that? Oh, sure. Yes. I think it's really important that outlier detection can't really be just done by the statistics, right? I mean, it has to depend on the context that the data lives in. Uh, if the data points are just inconvenient for your model, but are realistic for the scientific context you're working in, you know, deleting them has a cost. That is, you're now talking about a different population than you intended to talk about. So I had a collaborator show up and say, we deleted these because so we ran this test and it told us they were outliers. I'm like, you know, are they outliers? You know, if they're real behavior of individuals in your study, they're not necessarily outliers. Mm -hmm. yeah, I completely agree. Um, and, and I think I indicated that uh, we don't want to delete outliers generally. That's not the, what's more interesting, I think, in these uh, applications uh, is the outliers themselves. So you use one of these methods, and one of my favorite examples was, and I put it, I cited it in the grammar of graphics, uh, an article in the American Sociological Review where they identified uh, a frequency of sexual intercourse by women over 50. And clearly, it wasn't a woman over 50 writing the article because the frequency was reported as something like, uh, I think 30 or 40 times a month. I don't, I don't actually have the, the exact, but the point is uh, this occurred because SPSS had a missing data code in the data set of 999 for missing. And the author didn't realize that the data had been coded that way. But I told a psychologist once, I thought a really interesting study would be to take a test like the MMPI or the California Psychological Inventory and don't look for average values on the, or profiles on these variables, but find the outliers and then go personally interview these people. Because outliers have intrinsic interest of their own, I think, and, and that's where a lot of these methods are coming to be used in industry and elsewhere is, is it an impossible value or is it something I never thought about? Wow, yeah, that could have been coming from this population, but it's a rare event that's quite interesting. 
uh, you mentioned Peter Russo, Russo and I, I believe he was the author of uh, uh, the, the silhouette diagrams, which is one of my yes. favorite ways to uh, evaluate Absolutely. the quality of a cluster. Yeah. And, and also to identify quantitatively what points uh, don't fit so well in any yeah. cluster. So it reminded me of, of, of the clustering and outlier detection maybe within clustering. So I, and it's one of my favorite tools, so I wanted to mention it. <laughs> yeah, his, by the way, his work on breakdown points and median absolute deviations in, for, in the regression context, I'd almost recommend if you have time and you need to compute a regression, run Peter's stuff first, see what you get for the estimates, and then go ahead and run an OLS or some other you know, estimation method and find out if they're radically different. And that's a one good way to alert yourself to the fragility of a model. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, Vincent, um, some of our uh, viewers wanted to understand a little bit better if theoretical data science is a new term to add to, to the terminology of today's talk, or was, was that something that you're trying to emphasize maybe some of the underpinnings of, of data science tools from a rigorous point of view, or what was your thinking behind the use of that? Uh, uh, mostly, uh, I wanted to introduce the, the concept of theoretical uh, data science. I've not read anything about theoretical data science in, in the literature, but I've read essentially that the data scientists, uh, I've, I've read a lot of criticisms. They're ignorant. They know nothing about statistics. They, they just coders or stuff. I exaggerate a little bit what, what I've read, but there's a lot of things like that, uh, especially there used to be kind of a conflict between statisticians and uh, uh, data scientists, and essentially that uh, it was anything but uh, theory and that the word science was abused because that's not a science. So that's why I wanted to bring uh, the fact that it's actually possible to do uh, some, some science and, and that problem I, I brought with the six degree of separation is exactly the same like in computer science long ago it's a theoretical problems and the graph theory and stuff like that for those who've read about the literature and I wanted to actually some because I, I wrote about that uh, six degree of separations between two data sets and there's a guy who made a little bit fun of me say oh now everybody did, anytime there's a data science conference everybody's going to mention that that thing, six degree of the separation between uh, two uh, data sets to make it appear like it's you know, more rigorous and more scientific. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, the six degree of freedom analogy brought up a question from one of our viewers and uh, I don't know this term differential privacy, but the question is, is there, is there a connection between six degrees and differential privacy? Uh, no, I'm not familiar with, uh, I'm not sure exactly what the dif uh, differential uh, privacy uh, is actually, so I'm okay. probably not the best uh, guy to answer that question. Okay, but then maybe instead of that one, uh, or maybe we can come back to it later if the viewer writes in again, but um, your examples uh, looked like they could be useful just in, in terms of talking about statistics as, as opposed to data science. Do you agree that some of the, the uh, points you were making with your interesting examples could could apply just to more traditional statistics classes as they weren't necessarily uh, exclusive to the context of big data or data science, do you think? Well, first, uh, uh, as some of uh, if you guys know, my background is in uh, statisticians, so I have a PhD in statistics and statistic word for, for this. So um, I'm a former uh, statistician for sure. And uh, recently uh, I've been more involved in, in really statistical and even mathematical uh, statistics and stuff like that. And so I want to uh, bring it back into uh, data science and show that, uh, you know, uh, not only uh, there's use of uh, real statistics, I mentioned the Berrius and theorem, for instance, which is not something you, you learn in, in university, I guess, but uh, also that discoveries in data science itself uh, like the, num the, the, the data set I've been working, the real numbers, the infinite data set, they, they are challenges, but they can lead to some inter interesting statistical discoveries as well, uh, which is a trend that I would like to see more, like data scientists can contribute to uh, uh, statistics as, as well as statisticians obviously contribute to data science with this stat uh, statistical knowledge. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, Hal, a nuts and bolts question for you. 
uh, can you shed some light on how to handle highly unbalanced outcomes in the case of logistic regression? I, I saw that question. That's actually a really interesting question and not, yeah. a, not an easy one no. uh, to handle. So if you have a setting with a very imbalanced data set, um, some of the examples you see are uh, fraud data sets with, uh, I think Kaggle had a competition in this or, or some, some other site um, with a very large number of observations, a very small fraction of which are actually fraudulent. And so you want to build a classifier to do that. Um, you know, one thing to do is just declare everything is not fraudulent and you make very few errors overall. Um, and so you have to kind of focus in on the different error rates um, you know, type one and type two, or so the false positives and false negatives um, to, to really even understand that you have a problem in that setting. Um, so there are a variety of approaches that people talk about. I don't have a ton of personal experience, um, but, you know, waiting, you know, down, down sampling from the large group or trying to upsample from the small group, which is considerably harder to do, actually, because um, there's a real peril if you have a small number of absolute cases in the small case that you'll overfit to them. Uh, especially in the settings we're talking about with typically a large number of predictors. So it's really dangerous. It speaks to the importance of keeping out a test set um, for sure so that you don't overfit. Um, and then uh, some of the things I like to think about are kind of downsampling from the, randomly from the big population um, and then knowing that you kind of have to adjust at the end for the relative incidence rate. So that you know, if you're doing a logistic regression, you'll get the intercept wrong if you downsample. Um, but the relationships variables should still be okay. So I hope that helps in terms of pointers, but it's actually a hard problem. Yeah, no, I think that does help. I, I think the, the idea of downsampling, just to clarify, would be to maybe just take a fraction of the over, not overrepresented, but the highly, a fraction of the highly represented class to make it more equitable to the underrepresented class. Is that it? Correct, yeah. correct. correct. All right. Um, Victor, uh, we, we had a question for you about um, that it, it, there's, a, there's a sense out there, perhaps uh, valid, that statisticians are concerned with uh, explaining and machine learners are concerned with predicting. And uh, do you think that's an accurate characterization or is there a better way uh, or is that even just not a, a direction to go to try and create that dichotomy? Um, so I have been working with uh, many uh, people from many disciplines, including um, economists, statisticians, and, and computer scientists. And when the three disciplines trying to solve similar kind of problem, they have similar, they have a different kinds of mentality, if you will. So economists tend to learn, try to do more explanation and causality. And computer scientists, you know, if they are into, not all computer scientists are into prediction and, 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 and data science, but for those who are, they're more into prediction. So, so that's by and large correct. Statisticians are mostly somewhere between uh, economists and computer scientists. So it depends on who you talk to. Some statisticians are more into predictions. Some statisticians are more into explanation. And also, this is a generalized statement. Uh, so not all computer scientists are the same. There are computer scientists who are very into causal inference, of course. Mm -hmm. is, it, is, it too, uh, is, is it too broad of a stroke to say that, you know, that machine learners don't have a use for hypothesis testing or confidence interval estimation? Or they, they really just kind of want to know what the cross-validated error rates might be. It very much depends on the goal. If the goal is really pure prediction, there are many problems that are like pure prediction. Like if you are trying to translate a language from French to English to Chinese, then it's mostly a pure prediction problem. You may not necessarily need to understand why this stroke is equal to that stroke. Uh, likewise, to interpret text and voice in many cases is, a, is more like a classification or a pure prediction problem. Uh, but in, in many industries, you need to understand the causality. So why is it like that? Because if you know something about the why, you can add on it optimally. So that is the area you would need uh, causality, ca either causal inference or experimental design. So it depends on what kinds of problem we are trying to address. 
I remember taking a course at SAS once on their data miner package. And the example that was being used at the time was a credit card swipe uh, authorization. And the instructor was, was kind of implying that we, we didn't really care too much about interpreting the variables in the model or even knowing if they kind of had any interpretation or value from an intuitive point of view because at the end of the day they just wanted to know should they authorize the credit card or not you know so it was very difficult for me at the time to get used to that way of thinking because in statistics training i had you know that you don't just throw everything into a model and boost up r square as we know we could do right we're very careful about model selection so um to some extent as i've uh, lived within this new world a bit longer i I do see that that's, that's the case. When I teach data mining here at Riverside, I don't really talk a lot about model selection. Is that, is that a bad thing? You couldn't get away with that today. Uh, very simply, uh, in the banking industries and in other industries, and I'm talking about clients we actually have at H2O, we work with regularly, you couldn't possibly uh, give them a model that they could not understand. Uh, mm -hmm. And companies like Wells Fargo especially, uh, are intent on getting completely interpretable models because of the regulatory climate. You just can't do one of those models anymore and get away with it. So how would you then be able to use a random forest in, in that sense? Well, there, there is a big uh, active debate going on, but also intense research on uh, uh, the interpretability. In fact, uh, you might take a look at Cynthia Rudin's work and uh, uh, some others <laughs> in uh, uh, some of the people at Wells Fargo have published on this. And um, uh, a lot of these involve surrogate models where you, you finally get the predicted and observed values. And then you go ahead and fit some type of piecewise model or even some curvilinear ones, uh, you know, uh, generalized additive models, for example. And now you can approximate what the uh, ML technique actually did and use that for interpretability. The best thing, of course, is in, in the end, at least from what I hear in people in that group, is uh, uh, to fit the ML model find the most important predictors and then redo the model entirely as a generalized additive model or uh, some such. So it's a very interesting area, hugely researched right now. So, yeah. I'm glad to hear the direction turning a little bit back towards interpretability myself. Yeah. And by the way, sorry, I, I, meant, to, I meant to mention um, uh, Vijay Nair, also has been working on that at Wells Fargo. Some, some you know, pretty heavy duty people have been giving this a lot of thought. Indeed, yeah. Uh, so we're winding down. I just wanted to give each of you a chance to uh, maybe make a closing comment. Um, and uh, if there is a, a special book that you would like to recommend to our readers, that might be something you could offer or anything else that you would like to say. Uh, maybe we'll go in the order of our speaker. So Victor, uh, any closing comment? Sure. Um, so I, I think statistics versus computer science is not really a competition. It's really a collaboration. And uh, as well as econ economists and, and operations researchers and so on. So at least in the corporate world, we are not treated as different groups of people. We are treated as one single group of people, whether you have degrees in statistics or 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 computer science. And we work together uh, very well. And we can share knowledge and techniques with each other. So that's... Great. A huge partnership. Okay. Al? It's one of my collaborators say, I guess I violently agree with Victor. Um, he, uh, 100%, which is, you know, I view, as I said in my presentation, a very broad set of quantitative skills. It's kind of a big house. I, I, I heard someone talk about science. It's a big house. There's room for everyone. And I think the quantitative side is a big house and there's room for everyone. And we tend to stereotype and characterize and say computer scientists X and statisticians Y. And, it, you know, it's a very wide uh, spread in all these places. I was really excited when I moved to Irvine because I found that the computer scientists made extensive use of probability modeling. That's what we do. 
Um, you know, there's some who don't, but there are many who do. And, you know, statistics includes people like Lee, who are kind of at the forefront on the computer science side, um, and people who do a lot of theory. And um, I think it's great to collaborate, as Victor said, on, on teams, um, and to make sure we all try to continually broaden our toolkits and our skill sets. Mm -hmm. Lee, what would you like to leave us with? Well, I just thought there's so much hype coming out of Silicon Valley, um, mainly because there are hundreds of AI companies. And uh, the, the, uh, I'd recommend Kathy O'Neill's Weapons of Math Destruction. Uh, she's a PhD pure mathematician who worked in the finance industry. And there's a lot of really good stuff in there. I'm not saying she's right about absolutely everything, but she brings up cases where you're, you should be appropriately troubled by the thoughtless use of AI. And again, I, I'd like to give a plug to Cynthia Rudin because she's really starting to write some general articles for statisticians to explain this interpretability problem and why it's very serious. Great, yeah. I, I, I can't resist. I would like to plug Nate Silver's book, Signal in the Noise, for similar. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, great yeah. stuff. Right. Vincent, uh, what, what about you? Uh, what should we remember from this discussion then? There's a very uh, interesting discussion where we uh, you know, try to make friends between computer scientists, uh, statistician, economists, as opposed to a few years ago, it was kind of a, a war uh, somehow. Uh, one thing that I would like to, to mention, uh, obviously it's bias, it's my book, the recent book that uh, I've written, uh, title is Statistics, New Foundations, Toolkit and Machine Learning uh, Recipes. You're going to find a lot of uh, interesting uh, new material here that blends, like we've done here, a lot of, you know, machine learning, uh, data science and, uh, and statistics. And look at uh, machine learning, like in my title, like, well, like a set of recipes. Uh, at the end of the day. All right. Well, well, it was a real pleasure for me to uh, be involved with this and listen to you. I, I think ASA will be very proud of all of you for delivering on their call for playing a role in communicating and uh, uh, fostering conversations about the role of statistics and data science. So thank you very much. And this concludes our webinar today.